You're listening to the Safety of Work podcast, episode 22. Today we're asking the question, are facts or stories better for influencing attitudes? Let's get started. Hey everybody, my name is Drew Ray, and I'm here with David Proven, and we're from the Safety Science Innovation Lab at Griffith University. Welcome to the Safety of Work podcast. If this is your first time listening, then thanks for coming. The podcast is produced every week, and the show notes can be found at safetyofwork.com. In each episode, we ask an important question in relation to the safety of work or the work of safety, and we examine the evidence surrounding it. We're recording this episode on 19th of March, and David, very appropriately, you've picked a topic relating to diseases sweeping across the country. So what's today's question? So Drew, today's question is, are facts or stories better for influencing attitudes? And like you mentioned, this uh, episode will probably come out in about four and a half weeks. So we might be able to make some, uh, see what we're like at foresight and make some predictions about what the world might be like in four and a half weeks time because we're just entering um, quite drastic measures associated with the COVID-19 virus. But um, this is an episode that I've wanted to do for a little while, Drew, so I'm glad that um, glad that we're recording it. And so, so safety is focused a lot uh, throughout the last 20 or 30 years about understanding and changing individual attitudes, beliefs, and, you know, even as far as values. And this is an attempt to to either maintain or change the behaviour of people within organisations, workers, managers, safety practitioners, and so on. And some of our listeners might think that discussing attitudes is somewhat of a departure for us, Drew, but um, understanding individual and social psychology is no less important for any of the safety theories that you might subscribe to. We're going to go on a bit of a wander through some research outside of the safety field, more into the medical and, and social psychology field. And we're exploring this idea of whether facts or stories are more effective for changing attitudes. And then we're going to draw some parallels to what we do in safety. The motivation for this episode, Drew, I think I first brought up with you probably a couple of months ago, was a research finding that I came across, uh, which got me thinking about the strategies that we've had in safety for a while. And, and particularly, there's a lot of great speakers that can come into your workplace and talk about their life-changing accidents. And I'd always been somewhat skeptical of these types of interventions, you know, bring someone along who's had a really life altering accident, let them tell their story that it could happen to you and hope that that then changed the way you feel about safety within your organization. But this research and thinking deeply about this research has somewhat changed my mind in relation to the complementary nature of that kind of an intervention and, and what it might do in your organization. But before we get started, Drew, I've, I've done the introdu introduction that you'd normally do. Do you want to talk a little bit about storytelling and sense making in in safety more broadly? Sure. So, so I have to admit that having read today's paper, I've always been skeptical of the types of interventions that has trotting out someone who's been injured to talk about their accident, and the paper has not changed my mind in the slightest about the ineffectiveness and potential harm of those sorts of interventions, but. I do want to be clear that storytelling is a really important part of pretty much all aspects of our culture. It's embedded in the ways that we put ideas together and make sense of the world around us. And so that's obviously, if it's true of kids growing up, if it's true of how we learn, if it's true of how we make sense of the world, it's going to be true of how we understand what's going on at work as well. And there's a wide range of research ranging from ethnography to experimental research to safety climate type research that says that the stories we tell, at the very least, they reflect how we feel and think and make sense of safety. And changing those stories very possibly, not quite as strongly evidenced, can change and influence the way that we think and feel and act about safety. I think recently, Drew, you published a, a paper with, with Derek and, and Sid around um, just accident narratives within incident reports and how it changes the way people feel about the causes and the recommendations of those accidents just by changing the way that the accident is described. Do you want to 
Is that sort of what you're referring to also now? Yeah, so what we were testing there was whether changing the language that you use in an incident report and then show that those different versions of the same incident to people causes them to come up with different recommendations. And I think incident reports very clearly show the power that stories can have at very specific points in time. If you think that any report about an accident is in a sense storytelling and sense making. You're taking a set of incidents, you're taking a set of events that happened, you're giving meaning to those events, you're selecting particular other events and joining them in for a meaning process. And it very directly then results in attempts to change the organisation. Now, now that's a little bit artificial because incident reports have very clear recommendations out of them. And most stories don't. Most stories don't say, you're here, I've told you the story about gold locks of the three dwarves. Now here are my five steps to avoiding porridge-related mishaps. But still there's, there's very often an implied meaning there. And so, yeah, that, that's, that, that's the power that stories have is they link together events and ideas into patterns and those patterns then suggest what we're going to do next. So if I move into the first paper, Drew, and I like this, we're, we're trying to be more more spontaneous with the podcast, so we're, we're less and less sharing the preparation before we put each other on the spot. So I like the way that we started there, and I'd said that um, I've somewhat changed my mind about some of these safety interventions, and you vehemently opposed and, and said that you haven't. So this is this is um, at least going to be a bit of fun. So the paper that I picked out was was to do with uh, anti-vaccination and and pro-vaccination, I suppose, and it's it's quite topical and it's quite emotional. It's not our intention in this podcast to to criticise anyone's individual beliefs or attitudes around around vaccination. But full disclosure, I'm I'd consider myself very pro-vaccination. Drew, what's your personal position on vaccination? I am both pro-vaccination, and I've spent a chunk of my life essentially as a activist in the sceptical movement. So that is specifically trying to combat incorrect beliefs about things like vaccination. So I'm, I'm not just pro-vaccination, I guess I'm anti, anti-vaccination. Okay, so there's um, very strong bias on behalf of ourselves as hosts, but um, let us lay out this article because the headlines that grabbed my attention were um, a newsfeed item that said how to convince vaccine sceptics and how not to, and another headline that said scientists discover the one thing that can change anti-vaxxers' minds. So they grabbed grabbed my headline um, in one of my social media feeds and I went and dug out the original research just for my own curiosity, really. This study was published in 2015 in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences in the US. Uh, The authors were Zachary Horn, Derek Powell, John Hummel and Keith Holyoke. I looked these guys up, Drew. They're, They're split across two universities in the US, the University of Illinois and UCLA. They publish extensively in psychology journals. They're both from schools of psychology. They publish in relation to knowledge, beliefs, learning, reasoning, creativity, a whole raft of sort of individual psychological constructs. So I might just go into the method now, Drew, just to give our sense of of what the study involved. And I'll I'll try to do this this quite quickly because it's like some of the other psychology studies, it was quite involved in in doing the doing the research. They developed a five item vaccine attitude scale. These were questions like I think the risk of side effects outweigh the potential benefits on a scale of one to five. I plan to vaccinate my children on a scale of one to five and so on. They checked the reliability of the answers to this scale against past vaccine behaviours, including asking people whether they'd had a flu shot in the past 12 months and whether that lined up with their vaccine attitudes on the scale. They managed to recruit about 800 participants on day one who completed this questionnaire, Drew, and they also gave them a whole list of additional questions on several other moral issues like abortion and euthanasia. And they did this to serve as distractors because they didn't want participants on the first day to know that they were specifically being asked about their vaccination beliefs. So they they put these vac- vac- vaccination-related questions amongst all these other moral-type issue questions. And then they inserted, Drew, which I had never seen before, um, these attention check questions where they got to a certain point in the questionnaire and they asked the question, we just want to make sure that you're paying attention. Select strongly disagree for the answer to this question. And something like 10% failed that, <laughs> that question um, in the first pass. Have you seen something like that before in a survey? I, I, I've seen checks in a survey before. I've never actually seen that particular one, which is 
uh, kind of cool in the way it indicates how many people do just tick consistently without paying attention. And particularly if they've been recruited with a $20 gift voucher or something to turn up and do a questionnaire. I thought that was quite novel. It, it might not be novel in psychology, but um, I enjoyed it anyway. But yeah, do, do just keep that 10% result in mind. If you see studies that report things like, you know, 10% of people believe that man never landed on the moon or 10 yeah. people think that the moon is made out of cheese. Is that yeah. 10% could believe, genuinely believe that or they could be the 10% who just... <laughs> Don't tick strongly disagree on the question that says tick strongly disagree here. Ticked all threes on the way through. So basically 315 participants turned up to day two. And first of all, what they did is they just checked that those 300 were representative of the 800 because this, this study required people to come on two separate days. And so obviously there's a, there was a fair attrition rate after the first day. So that's why the study only ended up with 315 people. So here's where it gets, here's where the main part of the, the research happened. They split these 315 people randomly into three groups. And what they did is they gave the first group, they, the first group read a paragraph written from a mother's perspective about her child contracting measles. This person's name, the, the mother's name was Megan Campbell, whose 10 month old son had suffered a life threatening bout of measles. The story included quotes like from the first person saying, we spent three days in hospital fearing that we might lose our baby boy, went on to write, couldn't drink, couldn't eat, was on an IV, seemed to be wasting away. Very emotional, very personal account of the impact of a small child with measles on on the mother. They also provided a picture of um, a child with measles to this group and three very short warnings, just reinforcing how important it is for people to vaccinate their children. So that was group one. Group two read a whole lot of information summarising recent research that vaccination does not increase the risk of autism and basically debunking a lot of the other myths and arguments used within the anti-vax vaccination type community. All of this information was compiled from the Centre for Disease Control website. So this was a whole heap of synthesised research finding, facts, information, essentially making a very clear logical and factual argument for why vaccination was the right choice. And then the third group, which served as a control group, read a completely unrelated piece about feeding birds. So Drew, three three groups. What are your thoughts on the way that the design was done? The, the only thing I want to comment strongly on here is that this was not a pre-selected group of people who are anti-vaccines. So even though when we come to comparing the results, they've broken them up into sort of like the group who most support vaccines to the group who least support vaccines, even that group who least support vaccines includes people who are generally somewhat positive towards vaccines. Um, so when we come to interpret the results, remember that this is testing on a general population, which is generally vaccine supportive. It's not testing on an anti-vax population. Yeah, that's a good limitation, Drew, just to understand, because like you said, they did do a reliability test when they found these results and and tried to get the people whose attitudes were most leaning, the third of the group whose attitudes were most leaning towards anti-vaccination and make sure the effect was still there within that group. But you're right. That third was only the third over the out of the whole sample. It wasn't necessarily thirty percent of people who were strongly anti-vax. Anti-vax. So, Drew, I you probably read ahead. You read the article, so I had in here the show notes. I was going to ask you what they what they thought they found. Do you want to talk about the findings? Sure. So, remember, we're basically saying which of these three interventions has most effect, and so they found that the one that has a story of someone whose child has had measles, along with a photo with the measles had a very strong effect on attitude change. Um, it made people more pro-vaccine. The factual information actually had the same effect as information about bird feeding. So, you know, telling people information about how vaccines work and how effective they are didn't really have any effect at all. That's, um, Drew, that, I just, I, I found that so fascinating. I, I... You know, and we talk about evidence-based practice and, and this whole podcast is based on providing kind of evidence and, and I suppose as close to factual information as we can around safety. And this idea that all of this information from the Centre for Disease Control, all of this synthesised finding out of research papers and all of this had no impact on changing the attitudes of people in relation to vaccines. I, just, I was fascinated by that finding. To, to be honest, I was less surprised by that because this is something that I've Encountered a lot, and I, I struggle a lot personally with 
trying to be compassionate towards people who reject scientific information and try to understand where it's coming from. And one of the key things is if you keep in mind that a large part of disbelieving in vaccines already requires you to distrust the scientific community and distrust doctors as a source of information. You, you, you can't trust your doctor who's telling you to have a vaccine and also believe that they're trying to force something on you that's bad for your kids. And so when you think, okay, we're giving information that is official government information about vaccines... If you've already got an anti-vaccine belief, then you've already got a distrust of that sort of information, distrust of that as a source of information. Whereas if you're pro-vaccine, then any information is actually just going to support that existing belief as well. Yeah, but I, I think, and interestingly, it didn't necessarily enhance the attitudes of the people that were already pro-vaccine because it was more like a reinforcing of what they thought or assumed that they already knew. And so the, the research has concluded basically that... Um, what doesn't work with changing the attitudes of people in relation to their attitudes towards vaccination is to tell them that their fears are uninformed or, or erroneous. So telling them they're wrong and telling them that they don't understand the science doesn't work. What does is reminding parents and, and even people who weren't parents that, the, um, that measles or some of these other illnesses are terrible diseases and that they can protect their children by vaccinating them and doing that in a very emotional, a very emotive and a very compelling way. So this is where I need to jump in and say that the bit about telling them that they're wrong doesn't work is definitely part of the scientific consensus around trying to change erroneous beliefs. There's a wide swathe of literature that says that myth busting, in fact, reinforces myths and fact checking just reinforces the belief that the media is biased. So when people hold beliefs which are against the scientific consensus, then trying to explain that there is a scientific consensus just has no effect at all. When people hold a detailed conspiracy theory, explaining to them that it's a conspiracy theory doesn't work. Um, you know, when people are scientifically ignorant, telling them that they're scientifically ignorant tends to get you the uh, your metaphorical equivalent of a punch in the face rather than someone listening to you. Yeah, or maybe even a, the literal equivalent. The other part of it that you know, what they found did work in this study is, is not, in fact, in line with the consensus. And, and I think that is a function of the fact that they weren't testing this out on a very sceptical group, a very you know, anti-vax group to start with. There, there are lots and lots of models of how people can change beliefs. And all of the meta-analysis says that none of them work consistently. This is really, really hard. When you say consistently there, Drew, do you just mean it's almost individual by individual? There's not, a, there's not a common human condition about how to change attitudes? No, what I actually mean is hold true across studies. And, and this is, that, that's part of the trouble is it's possible that changing people's minds does need to be a very personal individual thing. And the way we do studies is by taking a large swath of people and trying to see what on average changes them. And so one of the mistakes that people often make is they just take a general population and test against them. And you know, what works for people who already are undecided, you know, what works for undecideds is different from what works for people who disagree, which is different from what reinforces beliefs of people who do agree. So you've got to you know, really target your population. You've got to really target why they disagree. You, some people, their hesitancy about vaccines can just be a lack of information. Some people don't vaccinate their kids just because they never get around to it. Some people believe that the whole medical complex is out to get them. And you know, how you respond to those differs. So, you know, if the fact is, if people just like aren't getting around to it, then bombarding them with reminders works. But that doesn't work when you test that intervention on a you genuinely hesitant population. And I think, Drew, what you've described there is, um, and I just think it's important to talk about a practical takeaway when it's, when it's really obvious like that, because I was also thinking about how safety practices and the practitioners approach influencing people within their organization. Typically as safety professionals, we, we, we often want to influence a change in what people are doing in the organization, be it managers or workers. And to, to go ahead, telling them that what they're currently doing is wrong and pulling out a fact to do with a regulation or something like that is probably going to have that universal, you know, punch in the face. But finding out, like you said, finding out the specific 
logics for individuals about whether they're doing something because they don't know, whether they're doing something because they can't, because they're resource constrained or, or whatever the reason is, you know, and having an influencing tactic that aligns to whatever position the person starting from is going to make you a more, more effective safety practitioner. Is that a reasonable conclusion? Y- yes. And, and I think that sort of reasoning does take you down a path which says that there are times when telling people what the rule is, is very effective. You, you have some people who are very rule-minded and you, they just thought the rule was one thing. You tell them that the rule is another thing. Oh, yeah, thank you for telling me that. Now I know I'll make sure that I follow it. Uh, you have some people for whom these personal stories of injuries are just like really powerful. They think, yeah, that guy is exactly like me. I, I felt it. I feel immortal. And suddenly now I'm coming out of this feeling less sure and I'm going to check next time. That there's a big difference between you know, does this work as a general strategy which the answer is almost always no when it comes to trying to change beliefs and work works for an individual where any one of these tactics might work. Um, so, David, maybe it's worth sort of going through the some of the sort of general ideas of how to change beliefs that can work for individuals but don't hold up. I'm very happy. I'm very happy for you to do that, Drew, because you, you've gone and you've gone and had a look at it. Um, look at it for us. So I'm going to learn along with our listeners right now. So, so the one they're testing in the particular study we're talking about today, uh, they've talked about it as the idea of alternate belief, which is that rather than trying to fight directly against a belief, you just give people a stronger belief to latch onto. So the idea is here that you know people might be afraid of vaccines, but if we can make them afraid of measles instead then it's going to be hard for them to hold both of those beliefs at once. One of them is going to win. And we never actually have to combat their belief about the vaccines. All we need to do is give them a stronger fear of the measles. So that, that's one way of going about it. Myth busting is the one where you directly try to tell them, you know, the reason you think vaccines cause autisms is because of this particular study that was found to be fraudulent and the guy actually got locked up for being you know, disbarred and prosecuted for being fraudulent. And that's the, all other studies have contradicted that's the one that really appeals to scientifically minded and sceptical people, but they're not the people who believe in anti-vax in the first place. Sometimes uh, what works is sort of information deficit, you know, just explaining to people gently and calmly, here are the facts. Most science communicators suggest that that sort of information deficit model is not the one that works, but it's the one that a lot of teachers uh, default to, just because that's how we're used to persuading people of things, is assuming they start from nothing and giving them knowledge as a way of changing beliefs. A couple of the more effective ones that work quite well for some people, just not consistently on the broad studies, just making people believe that everyone else does it. So there was a fairly famous study that turned out to be totally fraudulent, where they were changing people's uh, uh, voting behaviour in optional voting elections by getting them to believe that everyone else on their street had already voted. Um, now, it turns out that the researcher was actually totally fabricating the whole thing, which is a bit disappointing. But that, that, that model has been tested in some other studies and sometimes has some effect. You know, if people believe that everyone vaccinates then, and it's just the normal thing to do, then they might do it. Or maybe, Drew, just to butt in there what we spoke about at the start, if, if people believe that everyone else is hoarding food and toilet paper from the supermarkets, maybe uh, I have to do it as well, even though I would never have believed that I needed to do that. Uh, yeah, yes, exactly. Um, And another one that uh, the evidence is sort of a little bit up and down whether this works or not, but at the very least, it's much more friendly than the other tactics, which is to actually engage and acknowledge people's concerns and try to find common ground. So you don't try to argue against them. You say, look, I understand how you feel this way. And, And sort of like, you know, you don't want to vaccinate because you care about your kids. And I want you to vaccinate because I care about your kids. Like, you know, leave the vaccination aside for the moment. Let's just agree that we both care about the kids. Um, and let's agree that like things are scary and that kids have to put up with so much. And I understand you know, you don't like giving your kids needles. You don't like needles yourself. You, why would you want to do that to your kid? You know, I acknowledge that. And that sort of connecting as a human being by acknowledging the concerns and fears uh, is believed in some cases to then help to persuade by building up that relationship of trust. And I personally like it because even if it doesn't work, at the very least, you've made a friendly connection with the human being. You don't both go away hating each other, distrusting each other because you're on different sides of the issue. And the other one that has some work, which I really don't like because it goes the other extreme, is essentially uh, the version of medical bullying, which is, I know better than you and I'm going to vaccinate your kids. And of course, I'm just going to do it. And you just 
basically dare the person to object loudly enough to count as an objection. And, and that, that, that does when people you know, present to a doctor at a time when they'd normally be vaccinated. That, that does have some effect in the, the kid walking away from the consultation being vaccinated. That, that, you know, with what harm to the relationship going forward. So, Drew, if, I mean, like every every week when we when we dig in a little bit into some of these questions, there's 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 whole disciplines of of research and and um, and really, I suppose, complicated frameworks and different effects going on all the time. But I think what you've outlined there is sort of six different ways of thinking about how to influence attitudes. Some of which are more or less reflected in in research findings, and some of which are a little bit more humane or a little bit more personable if you like. So I suppose this one finding isn't going to be a, a, a generalizable thing, but I did start thinking about what, what this finding from this research might mean for some of the other things we do in safety. Is there anything else you wanted to say before I kind of moved on? So, so, so the one other just one thing I wanted to point out is how hard it is to get good research on these things. You, the way we do a lot of these studies is over short periods of time. We measure people's belief. We give them the thing that's supposed to change their belief. And then we measure again. And obviously, that's not how people form opinions or change their minds. Uh, so really, you need to have much longer periods of time to test these things. And I think that definitely translates into safety. Is you, If we want to know whether a guest speaker is effective, we don't measure the effectiveness by measuring beforehand, getting people to fill out a survey straight afterwards how much they liked the speaker. Uh, we would need to have a consistent type of speaker coming into the organisation regularly and measure the effect on time of that sort of messaging. Yeah, and, and that so that was, that was one of the two things that I immediately thought of, and I've mentioned them both kind of in a roundabout way. When I read this study, I thought, gee, so I wonder, I wonder whether we can form conclusions about these these safety speakers or these workplace based safety accident speakers. People like our listeners might have heard people like James Wood, Alan Newey, Charlie Moorcroft, etc., who can come into your organisation and tell their own story of their own accident and how it change their life, what their life was like before, what their life was after, was like after, have people see them as someone just like them who thought it couldn't happen and, and, and maybe reflect on the, the attitudes they hold towards work and safety. And I, so I thought, about, I thought about that and I also thought about how we influence people in our organisation as safety practitioners to try to change some attitudes and behaviour. So that were the two practical things that I wanted to briefly talk about now. For the first one, I was thinking about a scenario, Drew, based on this experiment, where if I wanted to talk, engage my workforce around working at heights. Now, let's just assume, let's, let's put this in the context of physical safety, Drew. I'm not, I'm not saying for a minute, ignore doing all of the heavy lifting about physical risk controls in the workplace. But in addition to that, I'm sort of curious about the attitudes of people towards safety. And so if I pose this scenario to you, would I, if I wanted to, wanted to engage the workforce around work at heights, would I be better to prepare and present a presentation, you know, with all the facts stating that 65% of people who fall from a height of greater than one metre have a serious injury and here's all of the information and all of the rational logic and fact around working at heights? Or should I get a speaker to come in who's fallen from a height to tell their story about how it changed their life? That's scenario one. What, what are your thoughts? My honest immediate reaction is I would ask, what sort of workplace are you running that the difference between whether people are working at height safely or not working at height safely is a tiny increment in how scared they are of working at heights. Because that's effectively what both those strategies are trying to tinker with, is the level of sort of inbuilt fear and caution. And I'm, I'm struggling to think of good examples where that really is the difference. Because if, you know, if that was the difference, then we'd be seeing much greater variation in individual safety in exactly the same work sites. Because there are so many things other than what we do that tinker into people's risk perception. And if you think of like the drastic difference between the guys who put in my pool, working you know, happily at two metres with no protection, and guys on large construction sites where they've got yellow tape for any bump in the ground of... Yeah, less than half a foot. Those sorts of differences have to be far greater than you know, every six months what sort of information we give people. 
But if, if we sort of like zoom right in that question, let's let's like put all that aside and say that let's assume that the sort of level of in risk perception is what we want to tinker with. Which one is going to make a difference? Ha- having a story you can recall or having a fact that you can recall? And I would guarantee that it's the story. I appreciate you playing along with me there, Drew, um, even though there was a there was a fairly long disclaimer and maybe um, my mind's a little bit more simple than yours because um, they were the sorts of scenarios that were running, the practitioner type scenarios that were running around in, in my head. And I think, you know, maybe if we can put all that, put all that aside, all that context aside that you described and, and just reinforce that point out of this finding that, um, that part of the human condition is to latch onto, onto stories, you know, particularly if there's an emotion, if they, if there's some kind of emotional connection that can be tied to that story, as opposed to recalling, you know, facts that they've heard. So Drew, I did, I did go looking. So I went looking for some papers. I, I tried to find if anyone had done this, this sort of research, because there's a very strong claim on, Charlie Moorcraft's webpage that claims that following his speeches in organization, there's a, in quotes, proven 40% reduction in accidents. So I went and tried to actually find it. I, I, I don't know if you you are aware of any, but I was I went extensively searching for accident storytelling, influence attitudes, all of these um, these search strings, and I couldn't find any safety research that had been completed that tested these safety attitudes versus this storytelling approach around accidents and incidents that there is some research that was to do with um, the use of narratives and stories and accident rates and things like that. But it was so poorly performed that I couldn't even bring myself to show it to you by claiming that an increase in safety narrative storytelling reduced accident rates. So David, I don't think it's come to any surprise to you that I think that the proven 40% reduction claim is nonsense. Not just because I don't believe that it's possible, but because I don't believe it's possible to do research that's going to create that sort of evidence. You would you need to regularly have organizations that are having dozens of accidents. And then this one factor, this tiny change in belief that you get from the story, would need to have a massive influence repeatedly over and over and over with these really, really dangerous organizations and yeah, that, that, that's just almost self-contradictory. So, no, there's very little research on the effectiveness of storytelling directly. There's some really interesting research on how stories are used to communicate hazard information in organisations. Um, and some uh, we, we might even actually do an episode on it because I personally find it really interesting the way that the lessons that come out of official investigations and get shared are often less effective than the lessons that come out of people in the smoking huts having conversations and basically warning each other using stories of near misses. And those sort of spread through the organisation much quicker than the official investigation reports do with quite different messages. And yeah, there's, there's one uh, fairly... So I don't know if famous is quite the word when you come to accident studies conducted in Denmark. But the official investigation blames l- failure of communication protocols for some trackside workers nearly getting hit by a train. Whereas you listen to the stories that the workers tell, and these stories sort of percolate through the organization for years. It's you know, when you phone in your location to the controller, don't trust that they record it properly. <laughs> uh, which is probably actually much better, more useful advice than... <laughs> the official investigation recommendation and the stories do perpetuate that knowledge. Yeah. It's one of those things, you know, what do you do about communication failures as a cause, as opposed to what do you do about the recording accuracy of the phoned in location from track crews? You can actually, one, you can do something about one. You can, you can't. Yeah. And I think that there's sort of underlying message here, which is that the effectiveness of stories is going to depend on the type of lesson and result you're trying to get out of the story. Um, and so I think some people who tell the story, they're basically just trying to say, oh, I was careless. I got hurt. Be more careful. Care more about safety. And that's a really useless message. Whereas stories that embed particular hazards that may be invisible, except for the fact that people tell these stories, that can actually be really powerful. Yeah. I think the type of story and the type of learning that is buried, uh, buried, not quite the word, um, sort of like carried by the story 
you know, Trojan horsed inside the story into people's brains. If you think strategically about that, what sorts of messages do you want? And make those slightly more sophisticated, slightly less being scared, slightly more about influencing people into understanding particular hazards or understanding the dangers of work that might not be visibly dangerous. That, I think, can be really powerful. Yeah, so Drew, it was a surprise to me that the, the first search result that came up when I started pushing in all of these uh, these search string terms was uh, was a paper that you'd written called Tales of Disaster, the Role of Accident Storytelling in Safety Teaching from Cognition Technology and Work in 2016. I wasn't even aware that you'd written that paper. So, yeah, th- that one was... Uh, just to be clear, this is not a direct research paper. This is much more of a reflection on teaching type paper. So this is me trying to think about how I teach and trying to dredge up evidence to justify the way I teach and totally failing, but thinking that it's worth communicating anyway. So I realized that particularly in the teaching engineers about safety or teaching safety engineering, we use lots and lots of stories. We use lots of disasters. I had a whole podcast, which is telling people about disasters. And I was sort of wondering, you know, I stopped and thought, you know, why, why do we do that? <laughs> is it just to entertain people? Is it to scare people? Is it to teach something specific? Is it a good teaching strategy? And I wanted to understand that. And so the result of that paper was really the formulation of a theory that hasn't been tested rather than an actual result, which is I think that it is consistent with what we know about teaching, that we should be using accidents. And we should be using them to try to convey an understanding of how accidents happen, how events connect together, and what accidents are like from the point of view of people before the accident. Now, some of the uh, you've trotting victims out onto stage type stories fit that model. They're trying to say, you know, what was life like before the accident? What was I thinking? And can you recognize yourself in this? So I think you know, the model of teaching is probably the same. It's just that I believe in trying to convey a slightly different message using that story rather than just, you know, don't be complacent. So we might, Drew, I'll, might, I'll put a link to that um that paper in the show notes in case anyone wants to have a read. And we might, um, I think we're up to about two or three ideas for future episodes from, from today already. So that's helpful for the, for the future episode list. How about we move on to practical takeaways now? Um, and so out of this, this, if I, if we cast our minds back to the, the paper that we reviewed on the, on the pro and anti vaccination, they've basically concluded that it's more effective to accentuate the positive reasons to vaccinate and take a non-confrontational approach, which is what you described, Drew, when you were talking about the different ways of um, different models for changing beliefs. If you challenge people directly, they tend to become more entrenched in what you're challenging them about. They concluded this study has broad implications for persuading sceptics on a wide range of issues. Fighting something head on is never going to be an effective way to change someone's mind. So I suppose from a from a safety practitioner influence point of view, and Drew, I might, we might do a future podcast on safety practitioner influence because there's three or four really good papers about how safety practitioners have historically and currently do attempt to exert influence on others in their organization. And a lot of that research suggests that the way that the safety profession may be going about trying to exercise its influence is not consistent with some of the most effective ways that they could be influencing, which is why we tend to see probably a large range of professional practice within the profession, but also a big gap between people who are effective in their role as safety practitioners and people who are who are less effective. So think about this study in the context of how you go about using stories and how you go about the way you approach people in your organization if you're trying to influence or change the way that they think about something in relation to safety. Yeah, no, none of the evidence guarantees that what you try is going to work except to say that if you don't try to understand where someone's belief is to start with and try coming at it indirectly rather than head on, you're guaranteed not to work. So, you know, all strategies start with understanding the position of the person you're trying to influence first. You're genuinely asking them about their thoughts, beliefs, find out where they're coming from, find how strongly they believe, find where they justify that belief from and then come at it sideways rather than head on. A good saying is something like, uh, I don't care how much you know unless I know you care. So I also thought, Drew, about thinking about the use of stories in 
in your organizations. And, and one example that I had previously in my career was in relations to lesson learned. And we did a program in an organization where what we ended up doing was, uh, was having the team that were involved in a particular operational situation or incident, which included the whole team, the workers and the management and the safety practitioner. We had them actually go around to the different sites and the different businesses in the organization and tell the story of what was happening and, and, and what they learned. It's a little bit like what you said, Drew, about the conversations in the Smoko Hut. Uh, and we did this as a replacement for our safety alert process, which was a kind of instead of sending the, what, the A4 page around saying, this is what happened, this is what you should do, we, we actually sent the teams to discuss with the other teams and in their own words and answer the questions of the other teams and try to prevent some of these distancing by differencing and the gaps in information and the um, censoring of the story as it moved through the organization. So what would be your thoughts on on that as a kind of a process, Drew? I, I think it's a great idea. I, I think the trap to avoid is making people specifically list what they think the actions or recommendations are. You, in a good story, the lessons are buried within the story. And when you ask people having told a story, okay, and so now tell us what the takeaways are. Now tell us your top five recommendations. That's often where a sophisticated understanding gets dumbed down. And that's insulting both the person telling the story and the listener. If the story is well told, the lesson is embedded. You don't need to say, you know, okay, so based on my description of the accident, you, uh, we, we should have done a risk assessment. Um, yeah, we should have been more careful. You should be more careful. Just you, let, let the story speak for itself. Yep. And you can go back about four episodes if you want to look at um, dumbing something down into five bullet points on a PowerPoint and the lost information that goes along with, uh, with that kind of approach. Drew, is there any other practical takeaways that you wanted to um, pull out of this kind of wandering discussion? Uh, I guess the final one is just that it is very much an open question. What does work to change beliefs? And how desirable it is. So th this, this is part of practice where we shouldn't be throwing in solutions ready-made. Just because there are speakers out there with pre-prepared packages that lots of other organizations have used, don't assume the fact that everyone else uses them means that they are actually effective. The popularity of a speaker is not proof that their message is helpful for your organization. Yeah, good advice. And and in terms of invitations to our listeners and, and questions that we might prompt for discussion, I was really interested, Drew, to know how people are currently using stories or storytelling or worked, you know, case studies or something within their organization to convey sort of more implicit safety messages. Are they replacing any of their artifact type processes with more narrative based um, processes? And I think also I was wondering if anyone's doing any kind of measurement or evaluation of, of any of these processes and practices within their within their organization anything anything you'd like anything else you'd like to know drew uh, no th those are good questions and i'd like to know the answer too so david i'll throw it to you today we asked the question are facts or stories better for influencing beliefs so i think the answer to that is drew or my answer to that would be on the way through stories uh, are, are definitely better for influencing beliefs you know that disappointed me um somewhat and I'd probably put a writer on there so long as they're kind of non-fiction stories. I wouldn't be encouraging anyone just to make up make up stories and, and start sharing them. But yeah, look, clearly, clearly stories are more likely to be effective at influencing people's beliefs, either their own or ones that they hear. So that's it for this week. We hope you found this episode thought-provoking and ultimately useful in shaping the safety of work in your own organisation. As always, you can contact us on LinkedIn or send any comments, questions or ideas for future episodes to feedback at safetyofwork.com. 